So we're going to talk about telemedicine for a little while. Uh, uh, technology has advanced tremendously, uh, and this is how far it's advanced. Right this minute, while I'm up here, I am on call. I am on call for a nursing home in Augusta, Georgia. If they identify a patient that might need to go to any hospital, emergency department, they will call me on this phone, and through FaceTime, I will look at the patient and say yes or no. And uh, so far, I've been able to reduce visits by, I think it's just about 50% now, expanding that process. I'm going to tell you how we, how we got there and some bumps along the road and some history. How many of you have a telemedicine program right now? I know it's not uncommon. I'm tr the, the purpose of this whole talk is to get you pumped up about it so you get real interested in, in looking at telemedicine. Most telemedicine applications, the biggest one probably is, is teleradiology, are meant for an interaction between a professional and either a patient or a device to give ongoing care, to review things, et cetera, et cetera. My interest in telemedicine is to reduce emergency visits that are unnecessary. Every one of us sees all the time the stretcher comes in from the nursing home because the patient's hypoxic. We put the a, a pulse oximeter on the other finger and the patient's pulse ox is 97%. Uh, and they go back. And that was about $2,500 in most communities. And we do that every day, all day. And the other thing is, where do they go when they're ready to go back? They can't go back because it's now an unscheduled return to the nursing home. So when the ambulance people get ready to do it, they'll do it. Seven hours later, after this 90-year-old who has sundown, uh, sundown illness is crazy in your emergency department, nobody pays any attention to him, they finally get trucked back to the nursing home all that misery for no reason. And so that's what I'm trying to do here. So we're going to, I already told you about the technology, some of it. There's a lot of political barriers to the program because this is a big change. So for people who are afraid of technology, and I characterize a lot of those folks in the nursing home that work there, are afraid to use it, it can be difficult. But I want you to take away from this the strategic importance of telemedicine to the doctors who are available delivering health care in our country 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We're the only clinicians who do that. We need to empower ourselves to take more control. And Kevin said he hoped the federal government would, would uh, do something about mental illness, me too. But I want to take what action I can take in my local area to reduce our health care costs. So I'm going to go over some prerequisites for program establishment, and then I'll list a number of applications for telemedicine for us, and there's, there certainly are plenty of them. Uh, a long time ago, a Mass General uh, in Logan Airport had a connection. It was a, a microwave tower telemedicine grant funded thing, which had a little clinic there. They could take care of patients at the, Logan, uh, at the airport from Mass General. The grant ran out. Everything was unplugged. Microwave tower scrapped. Didn't really do much, and it was very, very expensive. Uh, teleradiology already talked about. There certainly are plenty of applications for rural telemedicine. I'm visualizing in the future a hub and spoke system where the, the tertiary care hospital uh, either uh, supervises or consults in telemedicine at the critical access hospitals, or even the next step would be to actually staff the critical access hospitals with mid-level providers and do telemedicine com communication about each one. Uh, telepsychiatry is, is very popular and is very useful for nursing homes, by the way. And that is sort of a, a scheduled intervention or a non-scheduled intervention by someone in a nursing home who kind of gets wigged out and they need to talk to somebody in psychiatry about maybe changing medicine. Cannot do that until you do the medical screening, though, just like in our departments. So I want to know, does the patient have a temperature of 102 and a urinary tract infection before we get the psychiatrist involved in something they don't need to be involved in? Jail applications. It's pretty expensive to send a prisoner to an emergency department because you have to send two or three guards with them, and they stay there forever also. Uh, and then my whole personal take on grants versus fee-for-service, I like to work on systems that are going to be self-sustaining, and I don't have to fill out 10,000 pieces of paper for a grant. So one of the prerequisites for establishing uh, a consulting telemedicine service is whether or not you're going to get paid for it. In the state of Georgia, we are fortunate we do get an office visit fee for each telemedicine consultation we do. Designated geopolitical areas, I put that in there because that used to be a significant barrier. I could not get paid for a telemedicine nursing home consultation if the nursing home were within my metro area. That's been now, uh, that's gone, and now we can get paid for the one right across the street if we want to. Um, so, Mass General, as I said before, that was microwave technology. Uh, when I was at the Toledo Hospital, I had a telemedicine program where we took care of patients using a paramedic 
on an island called Put-in Bay, an island that had a population of maybe 50 people in the winter and 5,000 people every day in the summer because it was a big resort for, for Northwest Ohio folks. Uh, a lot of those people got injured, and in order to get their injuries cared for, they either had to have somebody right there doing it, laceration for instance, or they had to be transported uh, uh, across the water six miles. The airline, by the way, is the world's shortest scheduled airline called Island Airways. Uh, th and they'd go to the local hospital. Now, that was very expensive and time consuming to do that transportation. So we used what was called POTS, or plain old telephone service, to transmit images. The images would get painted on a screen and you could just watch the image go up and down like that a half a millimeter at a time for 15 minutes before you finally could see the EKG or the laceration or whatever you wanted to see. That has now been replaced with the wonderful images we get today on our uh, iPads or, or iPhones. In between, there was a system of, uh, of T4 lines where, and T1 lines where you would get a great image on a great fixed screen, but the screen would, if you wanted to move it, it would be very heavy, and that was an original project in the state of Georgia to link nursing homes, which did not work because you had to take the patient to this room with the telemedicine unit in it rather than take your cell phone into the room where the patient was. That was time consuming, and a, a very smart LPN at 3 o'clock in the morning would, would realize that it's much easier for them to do what they all do, right? Pick up the phone, call the primary care who has a recording that says, if this is the nursing home, send the patient to the emergency department. And they hang up the phone and the patient comes to the emergency department. Um, the prices have dropped like a rock. Uh, when we first put in that fixed unit, $25,000 for the unit, $400 a month uh, lease for a T1 line, and then very expensive stethoscope and other peripherals and dermoscope and things you can plug in. Now, the, it was a great picture, high cost, but now it's a few hundred dollars for an iPhone or an iPad on each end, and that's all you really need. Uh, what we are going to add cost in the future, I think, will be with implementing point of care testing into places like nursing homes. Nursing homes are way behind the curve in terms of point of care, point of care testing. They do INRs, and pretty much that's it. So if you ask for a urine, you ask for a, uh, a basic metabolic panel, lots of things they could do easily there that would save thousands of dollars in transport. They can't do it yet, but we're, we're getting there. First, we want to get the connectivity and get people used to the technology. Uh, so an expensive hardware has given way to this very, very cheap, easy, good image hardware, keeping in mind that most experienced emergency physicians probably don't even have to see the patient to get a pretty good idea what the diagnosis is going to be anyhow. All this, these different kinds of methodologies, the, the Skype, uh, FaceTime, which is what you get when you buy your iPad, WebEx, it's all encrypted. I have to put a code into my, my phone if I get a call, and, and the image will all be encrypted for me. So what we're trying to do is avoid unnecessary emergency visits by doing remote triage to prevent the need for the patient to come in. We also take liability off the, sh off the shoulders of the nursing home physician, liability off the shoulders of the, emergency, of the nursing home nurse, and we can do it in many different places. Examples of other applications, uh, jails, we talked about them for a second, but how about schools? My particular county has 60 schools and 30 nurses. I have a pediatric emergency department attached to my adult emergency department. We're not open 24-7, but we're open during all the hours all the schools are open. If you took a school nurse and put that person in our emergency department and gave them a unit, they would have us to consult with on anything they needed to do and could manage several schools at once, a ma major budget saver for uh, this kind of a system. Uh, industry too, I mean, an industry might have a doc come to the industry three, four hours a day or whatever for a rather large retainer, and that could be replaced with a mid-level or a nurse who would just take telemedicine uh, consults from the uh, local hospital. So in order to do this, though, you have to have some sort of a nutcase like me who just will not ever give up because there are times when the politics become very difficult. Uh, you have to have institutional support. So not only you have to have a driver, a physician who wants it to happen and will work hours and hours and hours to make it happen in your particular institution, but you have to have your institution be aware and supportive. And then, of course, every nursing home has to be supportive. You can't just pick up the phone in a nursing home and say, I want to do this. You have to go there. You have to talk to them, answer all their questions. After you, after you give a lecture and talk about all the things I've talked today, 
They will inevitably raise their hands, and the questions are asked, you, that you are asked are ones you've already covered. They just don't listen to everything you say. It's just normal human behavior. Uh, an emergency physician group should be supportive. One doc can't really do it, so you have to have more than one provider available. Sometimes you'd like to take a vacation and not have to be uh, available on the phone. However, with this new system, you can take a vacation if you want to. Uh, I've been to Central America with this phone, and I can see images just fine from there. So you don't really have to stay in the hospital or in the emergency department. Obviously, you have to be uh, covered with liability insurance. To my knowledge, there have not been any lawsuits for telemedicine activity, with the exception of teleradiology. There are a few of those. But in terms of what I'm talking about, there haven't been any. Therefore, my carrier uh, through the medical school just to no extra charge, they just added onto the list of things that you do. Um, certainly you have to, you can't just walk into a nursing home and give orders, you have to be on their staff. And you all know who've been on a staff, you have to fill out a lot of forms. So you have to have office support to make the paperwork system go through. In order for me to be on call now, I had to go have a urine drug screen, which is a little bit much for me, but I, but I did it. You have to have a, a office system that will allow you to bill if you want this to be a sustainable endeavor in terms of your department. So uh, and you have to have the paperwork. And uh, not only that, you have to have some kind of need out there. If Nursing Home X has three primary care physicians who are the most dedicated physicians on the face of the earth and answer every call they need to answer from their nursing home, that's fine. But it, that's not usually the case, and usually they're not that good at, at making decisions about acute condition changes. So that's the bottom line here. For, we get called if there's an acute condition change in which transportation to an emergency department might be necessary. If it's obviously necessary, we don't want to call. Just send the patient to the hospital. Chest pain, broken hip, etc. cetera. Uh, House of Representatives Bill 6719 was introduced recently. It's called the Telehealth Promotion Act. This one, I don't know how much of a problem it's going to be. It allows uh, a provider in any state, me, to provide nationwide services in any other state. That has been going on for quite some time out west with uh, uh, technically breaking the law, but they're still doing it because it's, no one's bothering them. This act is now uh, is, is in, the act, in the process of going through Congress. If it passes, my, my fear is, is the same as the Georgia State Medical Board. There could be somebody in a garage who's really not very well qualified taking care of patients all over the country and sending out bills. And so I really have to know a little bit more about the implications of that part of the act. So what are the barriers in all of this? Well, there's a lot of technophobia out there. There's a lot of folks who just are afraid to touch the unit. It was much more difficult when we had these old fixed $25,000 units because that took some training and inevitably uh, they'd get trained on Monday, and the next time they thought about using it would be seven days later on the next Monday, at which time they lost 99% of their knowledge about how to access the system, so they just wouldn't access the system. So it just sat there gathering dust. Um, there are also primary care physicians who are nursing home docs who just don't like the technology. They're also a little bit paranoid because they think other folks are out to steal their business, and that we have absolutely no interest in that. I mean, imagine if you were a nursing home physician uh, and you, know, you wanted to have a reasonable life and somebody said, uh, you'll always be in control of your, physician, of your patient, but I will uh, take care of everything on nights, weekends, and holidays. Why is that? I'm an emergency doc. I'm available 24-7, 365 days a year. So it's, it's, it's actually uh, growing on our base, which is our availability. Uh, there's Dilbertism out there. There are people who are just bad managers, don't understand how to do anything, don't want to understand how to do anything, aren't interested in learning about anything. There are issues with compensation. Um, I, my partners at the Medical College of Georgia said, I might be interested in taking your call, uh, but what am I, what's in it for me? What am I going to get paid? And that's, that's not a bad thing. That's totally fair, because if you're going to give medical services, you ought to be compensated somehow. Doctor availability. Uh, maybe you can't find enough people to cover. Um, this nursing home I'm working with now that I'm on call with today does not call very often. So I have actually been on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week for two and a half months, and it's not been a real problem for me because they don't call at night. Um, but if I had 10 nursing homes, I probably would be pretty exhausted right now and, and be sitting down to give this talk. 
As I said, there's plenty of paranoia out there. I've, I, I've had one primary care physician that said, I don't want to hear about this. I don't care what you say. This will not work, and I will not participate. And he walked out. That was the end of it. So you can't get a conversation going with everybody. Uh, there, and resistance to change is enormous. Imagine uh, that you are the LPN at the nursing home, 3 o'clock in the morning, and you've got two ways of making this happen. You can go back and pick up that iPad and take it to the room. And what was it Dr. Janiak said about how to communicate? I, you know what? I remember how to use the telephone. I'll call the primary care physician. We'll send him to the hospital, and then I don't have to deal with it. So you have to have a nursing home management that's on your side in this regard to make this stuff happen. Uh, and then you can have certainly misaligned financial incentives. That's when the nursing home physician or the nursing home people think that what you're doing is you're going to bill them for the service rather than the patient's insurance. And, uh, and sometimes you have to explain it a hundred times to get them to finally get it. Okay. So how do you get this happen? You have to have lots of meetings. Uh, first, you call the nursing home and say, I'd like to talk to your, uh, usually I start with the nursing home director of nurses or the nursing home uh, manager, which is frequently a nurse, and just sit down and explain what I'm trying to do. Almost always, universally, I get a positive response. Then I ask to meet with the primary care physician or physicians who are the primary admitters to the nursing home. And then usually I get a pretty good response. Then I go back and have a group meeting with all the people in the nursing home that can make it that day, and we go over it for another two hours, and I show them a, a PowerPoint, and we talk about the advantages for their patients. Uniformly, the online caregivers are very, very enthusiastic about the the fact that their patients may not have to be gone for eight hours and bounce around in an ambulance and be in a horrible, uh, uncomfortable scenario in, a, in the, the corner of some emergency department if they can avoid it. Um, so once you get uh, staff privileges, and once you meet with the players, then you can probably go ahead with the project. Uh, and the nursing home cost is going to be an iPad if they want one or an iPhone. And if you have an iPhone already, your, your cost is really not going to be anything. Uh, of course, every doctor in the emergency department is going to have to, that participates, is going to have to have their own communication system. So uh, then you have the issue of who creates the policy and process. Who writes down, and ends up being me, is this is when you activate the system, this is how the communication is going to go on. You are going to pick up your phone, your iPad, and you're going to dial me, and that this is how you do it, and I'm going to communicate with you. After that is finished, I am going to dictate, now how do, where do I find that, what's that system, you have to get that set up, a note regarding the interaction. That note then is going to be sent back to the nursing home as evidence of what we did. Another part of the note goes to the primary care physician, so their paranoia will go away. Another note, uh, the same co uh, copy of the same note, goes to our billing service. So you have to have all that, the process set up, you just can't walk in and do it. Uh, the record keeping process, in the future will be much better because I think we will be marrying our electronic medical records with, with various entities and uh, certainly with the nursing homes we work with so that uh, we would have one major advantage. We can now access the, the, the record of the patient at the nursing home to get an accurate history uh, and our record will then electronically go into their record. There are little tiny things that seem tiny at the time but they're actually a big deal. When the patient comes in by telemedicine to me, and I write a note, how is that, what's the number that goes on the note? Is it the patient's nursing home number? Is it our hospital emergency department number? Is it both numbers? And if it's both numbers or our number, where does that number come from? Is it a virtual patient? Is there a process for registration? All these issues have to be worked out. It's actually kind of fun to do that. And then you have to, you have to follow through, you have to call them. The first couple of cases I got, that I actually used my iPad because they didn't have this new uh, cell phone yet. Uh, the next day, I, after a fairly sleepless night, I drove to the nursing home and examined both patients myself to see if what I saw on, on my iPad was what I really saw. And I was so excited because it was exactly, exactly what I saw. And both patients got to stay in the nursing home. One was a, a lady who had a fever, got sent to the hospital, had a big workup, couldn't find anything wrong. Urine culture was done. Urine culture results were not yet available, the patient developed a fever again, and nobody could figure out what was going on. And the only thing I could think of after hearing this story from the nurse is maybe they didn't look for a decubitus. So I rolled her over, and it was great. I saw her old backside, and it was just perfectly pristine, and that wasn't the problem. 
but I got nervous, so I drove over. Fortunately, it wasn't 100 miles away. It was just, just six miles from our place. But uh, it really was reassuring to know that the technology I was using was safe. And in addition to that, um, at our institution, I, fortunately, I have residents. I've got two residents and actually a medical student that are working on a uh, follow-up project with me. So every single one of these patients' interactions will be followed through to make sure we didn't do anything bad. Uh, they will um, then be recorded, and then the results, outcome results, will be, will be um, compiled, and then we'll be able to submit that for publication somewhere. It would be great to do it through the Alliance. You know, I think that would be exciting for us. So this place that I'm on call with right now is called Amara Rehabilitation. It's about a 200-bed nursing home. I never knew they were that big, but 200 beds seems a lot to me. Uh, transfers 97 patients a year to local emergency departments. Has an administration that values the process. They called me. I didn't call them. Has a staff that understands the value. I have one lady who got up and gave me a hug afterwards, one of the head nurses, because she was so excited about that. Uh, as a medical director who is totally overwhelmed, and that's because of some choices he made with the things he does, but he just thinks this is, this is great for him to get this patient taken care of. And I left the building and they went out and bought an iPad the next day before we had any paperwork done, before I was on the staff. They were, so they were really into it. Now, of course, there's always some other side to that coin. The other side of the coin is a week later, I called and said, where's your iPad? And they said, we, we misplaced it. I don't know what happened to it. So you have to help them through a lot of things like that. And also, uh, you don't get all the calls you'd like to get. So part of the research project would actually be to look at the patients that they elected to send without using telemedicine and see if that was appropriate. Um, I had one the other day that they sent over who had a one half centimeter laceration over his eyebrow and this 90 year old guy, he didn't need to sew it up. And I called and said, why didn't you use telemedicine? And the nurse said, well, because our policy is all head injuries go to the hospital. I didn't have any idea they had that policy. So I'm learning as I go along. Once we get the staff oriented, uh, then they identify a patient, once again, that might benefit from a transfer. And it's a gray zone. If it's obvious, please don't call me. Call the ambulance and send the patient. Uh, and, and speaking of calling the ambulance, I, I don't have this relationship with this one nursing home, but I was very much struck by the fact that the nursing home was almost touching the local hospital. It was that close. You could pick the patient up and walk, carry the poor lady into the, into the uh, emergency department. The transfer cost for the ambulance was $800. <laughs> so uh, you can see where I'm looking for this big margin. The money's not going to go into my pocket. It's going to be returned to the healthcare system. So I keep telling my residents so that if your kid ever needs dialysis or a kidney transplant, we might be able to do that for you. Otherwise, the way we're wasting money, we can't do it for anybody. Wasting money is a theme here today. Do you notice that money, money, money? That's pretty important. Uh, so uh, the nursing home staff identifying that would call our communications department, who would then call me, or now with the iPad and iPhone, they can just dial me directly. And then we fax the paperwork back and forth. As I said, that's going to go away in the future when we can a complete an electronic record that we share. Uh, so right now I'm linking by FaceTime. Uh, you can use any one of the other methods you want. Uh, the patient gets evaluated, recommendation is made for disposition. Um, all I did for this one lady that I could not find a cubitus ulcer on is since her urine culture was pending, I thought it was safe to start her on some Bactrim, which we did, and she did fine. Uh, copies go to everybody who needs a copy. And then, uh, once again, outcome evaluation, because I think it's really going to be important to show the world that what we're doing is safe and helpful. Interestingly enough, if you look at a potential loser in all of this, if I owned an ambulance company, I'd wonder, what's, what's Geniac doing to me? Every single ambulance guy I've talked, owners I've talked to, has been enthusiastically supportive. So I think, good for them. You know, they are busy anyhow, uh, doing lots of stuff, and I'm going to actually get to some of that stuff they're doing at the very next couple of minutes. They're almost done here. So some issues to consider. Who buys the iPad? Is the Wi-Fi encrypted? And by the way, you can't go to a nursing home and say, let's do this. And then they say, oh my God, we don't even have a computer in the nursing home. We don't have Wi-Fi. Can't do it. You got to have, you got to be a little bit more technological than that. Um, and where can the doc be? Well, as I said, you can be at home in the emergency department. You can be on the beach. It all works. That, that commercial of someone, the, the surgeon doing virtual surgery from a beach, we're getting close to that. And it's really very pleasant to take a break from whatever you're doing, answer a call. Two minutes later, you're done. You write it up and you're finished. 
Um, and a question I asked though is if you're on the beach, how are you going to create the record on the beach? You don't ha usually have the dictaphone with you on the beach, so you have to have some process in mind that you're going to be able to finally get that record cared for. Uh, and if you're in the emergency department, if you're the, in a busy ED, how do you manage the cardiac arrest and the call from the nursing home at the same time? And the answer is really quite simple. Nursing homes are used to waiting an hour, two hours, three hours for their primary care physician to answer. So if you can do something for them in an hour, that's amazing for them. They just can't get over how much, how great it is. I've had uh, five or six telepsychiatry consults in which I got called in the morning, patient was going a little nuts, and I was able to arrange a psychiatry resident to do an interview that afternoon. That was 48 hours faster than their normal process. So uh, one of the things, as I said before, we have to look at point of care testing. Uh, what are the capabilities of the emergency department? And that's going to be a problem for me and my docs because they're going to say, well, why don't you just start an IV and do a CT and an MRI and call me back? They, you know, some of them don't know. They don't have all the stuff in their nursing homes. So that has to be sorted out ahead of time. What kind of medicines do they have? Fortunately, nursing homes have a little bit more uh, capability than we think. Is a contract needed? I have one nursing home that says, well, let's do it. Another nursing home has delayed the onset of this process for a month now, try to get their legal department to look at the contract. Uh, it's important to leave, uh, to keep the patient's relatives involved in all this stuff. They should be aware that the nursing home is going to utilize this to keep grandma or grandpa from having to be injured or driven across town or spend a ton of money. Some pa patients will say, or parents, or no, I'm sorry, relatives will say, I don't care what's wrong, send them to the hospital every time. And so you don't want to get into a big argument there. That probably should be worked out ahead of time. And I already talked about psych evaluations. So we, uh, now just switch to another application, the jails. We have three pilot sites in Georgia. Uh, we're going to compare three jails with telemedicine support, three jails without telemedicine support. They just keep doing things the way they always did. Why are we doing the jails? Because our jail system, 60-some jails in the state of Georgia, uh, got audited. And in the audit, they were told that they were way off two standard deviations from what everybody else does in terms of transport to local hospitals. So the, the jail system is, is overwhelmingly exhausting money in this regard, and they want to stop it. Uh, they have just came right out and, and going to give us a flat fee for every consultation because they know how much money they're going to save. That one has been, implementation has been delayed because, as you can imagine, what jails look like inside with all the metal and concrete, Wi-Fi is difficult. So we're working on that. Uh, what we're going to do is Wi-Fi wi the clinics in the, in the jails, and we have to move the patient to the clinic because you really don't want to walk down into somebody's cell with, a, with an iPad. <laughs> it's it's going to be a little bit uh, difficult. So we're going to try to reduce the transfers there. My gut feeling is the reduction of transfers from a uh, nursing home will be more than a, from a jail. So uh, this is uh, my last slide. Uh, what I want to tell you what I think the future will be. I think the future will be this. I will be working in my emergency department and I will, my cell phone will go off and it will be EMS calling me. They'll be calling me from a home where they've been called to transport a patient to the emergency department because now that's what the law says. You just get to go. I will be asked if that's authorized for this patient. And when they tell me the patient has chest pain, I'm saying you shouldn't even call me, just bring them. When they tell me the patient has had low back pain for eight weeks, I'll say, no, they have to go somewhere else. And when they tell me, as, as I had uh, two months ago, a mother bringing in an eight-year-old by ambulance with ringworm, I thought that was pretty inappropriate use of funds. I think, just understand, our specialty is there. And we, if we ever got to be the gatekeepers, and you don't, may not want to be one, imagine the strength, control, and power we'd have. I'm not power mad. I'm just saying, imagine how important we'd be indispensable to the healthcare care system if we, if we did it that way. So I'm looking forward to the future. I'm excited about this project. I will be a poster this afternoon, right? I'll be around then and then at the reception for any questions or contributions. No, questions. <laughs> right. Thank you.